Hi everyone, welcome back to RoboCup at Home Education Online Classroom. Uh, today we have this uh, invited lecture series by uh, Luis Contreras from Tamagawa University. The topic today is uh, world representation through artificial uh, neural network and introduction. Okay, so um, I'm Jeffrey uh, as a host today and also we have Luis over here. So today we will bring you this um, invited lecture. Okay, so as a start, so let me um, briefly explain the whole setup. So this is uh, the time. So we have this uh, for all the friends all over the world. So hopefully like um, we will have more people come after this. And um, in order to get the slide, you can head over to the web page. So I put a link uh, on the screen. So you can head towards our website to get the PDF file of uh, what is showing in front of you, right? And as a reminder for privacy, uh, all uh, will be this session will be recorded into video, and we will publish this um, on our social media after this. So please make sure that you be careful on your own privacy. Right. So before we start, let me briefly introduce. Uh, to you, especially for those that first time join this session. So RoboCup at Home Education is an educational initiative in RoboCup at Home that promotes educational efforts to boost RoboCup at Home participation and artificial intelligence focus service robot development. So currently under this initiative, we have four efforts that is uh, under uh, active operation. So the first one is uh, we have the education challenge, the RoboCup at Home Education Challenge, which has been organized um, throughout the year in national, regional, and international. And later on, I will give an announcement that we will we actually have an online challenge that is going to happen in two weeks' time. So uh, at the end of this class, I will um, uh, explain more on the details and invite all of you to join us. Then for the second effort is uh, this open source educational robot platform which is we, uh, among our community, we actually open source our development, especially in terms of uh, robot building. So we have uh, open source, uh, sorry, open platform and also standard platform that we open most of our development code for sharing among our community in order for everyone to learn how to build service robots. Right, and for the third effort is this open courseware we try to gather and try to process uh, all the information and all the teaching materials that we have into this open courseware uh, in order for, to facilitate everyone to learn about uh, this AI-focused service robot development. And for this open courseware, uh, previously we have in terms of like workshop materials and also we have um, physical hands-on hand, uh, hands uh, workshop, but um, this year, we also add this online classroom. So uh, currently this invited lecture is part of the online classroom that we um, organize in order to spread our service robot um, learning uh, for the community. Right, and lastly, this outreach program. So all the contents, all the activities that we organize among us is not just for our community, but we also wish to outreach all this information and also resources to all the community around the world. So just in case that uh, you feel that this content is very suitable and also you would like to introduce to your community, reach out uh, to us and we will discuss how we can actually uh, help you to bring all these materials to your community. So for more information, please um, refer to our website over there. And also we have a, a Facebook group. So um, we have this Facebook page over there that you can um, access from the link. Then under the page, we actually have a group that you can join in order to communicate and also interact with us and also our community. Okay, and below down there is, uh, they are all our sponsor uh, for all the events and also activities throughout uh, all our development all this year. Thanks on the sponsor and also thanks for you to join us today. Okay, so for this online classroom, um, it, is, um, it started with a regular online class track, which is we introduce uh, 
a six weeks class to the public uh, about how to build service robots. So you can head to our uh, website, the link over there to see the detail of what is uh, what are the content for that. And for this uh, online challenge that happened uh, recently, I mean like for, for these uh, three months, we also arrange um, special track that we introduce uh, beginner teams and also newcomer on how to build robots in terms of open platform and also standard platform. So we have the SoftBank Pepper as a standard platform. So you can find out more information from our website. Then most recent one is we started this uh, invited lecture, which is uh, we started um, early of this month. So we already have uh, a few classes before. And also last week we also have Luis that introduced you for uh, the topic on robot localization. So today we will have this and later on we will have more of this kind of uh, invited lecture uh, to promote um, this kind of learning for the general public. So stay close and stay tuned to our uh, website for more information and please share this information uh, among your community to let uh, more people to join these activities. Okay, so now uh, please allow me to introduce our speaker today. So Louis um, received his PhD in computer science at the Visual Information Laboratory in the Department of Computer Vision, University of Bristol, UK. So currently he is a research fellow at the Advanced Intelligence and Robotics Research Center, Tamagawa University, Japan. He has been an active member of Biorobotics Lab at the Faculty of Engineering, National Autonomous University of uh, Mexico, Mexico. He has been working on service robots and has tested his uh, latest result at the Eurobo Cup and similar robot competition for the past, for the last uh, 10 years. Okay, so this is just a brief introduction. So I will uh, hand over the mic to Luis for more detailed introduction about himself. And uh, I would like to invite him to start his um, lecture today. Right, so Luis, I'll pass to you. Okay, let me... Do this. Okay. okay. So, hello, uh, I'm Luis. Uh, as Jeffrey said, I work in the Tonago University in the Advanced Intelligence and Robotics Research Center. We focus on service robots. So, these kind of robots are robots that uh, can be used in indoors, uh, household uh, activities, for example, uh, bringing drinks or taking care of elderly people and, and so on. So, we are now focusing on uh, human robot interactions and all those uh, techniques that allows a, a robot to perform uh, well in, in a way that, that a human doesn't feel uh, threatened or uncomfortable with the uh, with a robot presence so in, in today's talk I will uh, show you what we do to uh, uh, make the robot navigate in a free space so as I mentioned a, a robot uh, has to perform a task in, in a given environment so what information is useful for performance task is one important decision that the programmer should do. So how we do, do that, uh, there are several techniques that I hope uh, today we, we can go through. But the first idea before uh, having a world representation is what is a world and what is a representation of that world, a, a valid representation. So one technique what we usually do is base the word representation in the sensors input we have. So if we have a laser, a 2D laser, our world we will consist of a series of 2D measurements, distant measurements in the 2D space. If it is a temperature uh, sensor, our world will consist of a series of temperature measurements or humidity measurements in this, in this uh, case. So the task and the sensor relationship is very important uh, to decide how to represent uh, our world. 
if, for example, we have a humidity sensor and our task is to predict uh, the rain, we can do that through a representation like the one in the plot. So we have X that is the humidity level and Y the chance of, of rain. So if we use this approach, how can we represent our world in, in, a, in a valid way? So if we have only one measurement, can we predict uh, future uh, rain possibilities uh, with that uh, data? Maybe, maybe not. So what do we need? We need to collect more data. If we have only uh, these two measurements, we can start seeing a trend, but we cannot uh, argue that it's a valid trend because we have uh, very few data. If we start collecting more and more data, uh, our world representation that consists of the humidity levels uh, uh, with respect to the rain is, going, uh, more, is becoming more accurate. So we can start uh, having uh, some trends and, and start modeling our world using this, these measurements. If we continue collecting data, we can have uh, enough uh, information to do uh, or to make a valid representation. However, given the data from an input sensor and the task that is to, um, uh, in this case is to uh, detect the chances of rain. How can we model, how can we generate a valid model that, that fits that task? So we can say that we can take the average of these measurements. We can have a, we can propose a value. Then we can measure the error of this representation with respect to the measurements, correct the value, adjust the, this value until we have a minimum error. So this representation consists of, a, is the average of all this data, but we found it by a, a recursive manner. We propose a, a value, then we measure the error and we insert the error in the model, and then we do the, the recursive. So is this representation uh, valid to predict the rain in a given area? Well, as I mentioned, in the, it depends on the task. If the task is to determine if a, if a region is a desert, is a forest, is a valley, maybe this representation is enough. If the average rain in one year is below some level, we can argue this is a desert or this is a rainy forest or this is a, 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 valley, a valley or something like that. So maybe this representation, although it's very simple, it provides some information because we have enough data. However, if our task is to predict the chances of rain in a given day, uh, given a specific value of humidity, maybe this representation is not enough. We might create one representation that uses a linear uh, variable, and then we can sum this representation, and we can measure the error of this proposed uh, model, insert the error into the model, and adjust the model again recursively until we have a model with the minimum error. With this model, we can predict the chances of rain given a, a value of humidity. Is this valid, this is uh, enough for our task? Well, it depends on, on many uh, variables, but we can say that it is it better represents our model than the previous. Uh, constant uh, representation. We can keep doing that. We can keep uh, inserting some uh, variables uh, with different levels of linearity and exponentiality, and then we can create more complicated models. Is this more complicated model that obviously the error of the model is going to be zero in this case? better than the previous model? Well, it depends on the task, on the variables, and in many things. So in this linear regression models, one important thing that I have been mentioning is 
It depends on the task and, and the response of the model to that task. So I am assuming here that the uh, designer has some uh, knowledge on the problem, has some uh, knowledge on the data and can decide which model is better or not. It, it can create, he can create a valid uh, rule to decide which model is better. But it is not always the case. Sometimes we don't have enough information to decide which model is better and we rely only on uh, randomness. So which model is better? How do you generate uh, such a model? So those uh, questions, uh, we, we aim to sort those questions in the next uh, slide. So I want you to keep this idea of a regression model. We can have a regression model with a, a constant value, with a linear value, or with a exponential value. And depending on the variables, uh, the complexity of the model is going to increase. But please keep this in mind. So given that, that context, I want to introduce you to artificial neural networks. That is a way to represent uh, this world uh, data into a more complicated model. Then I will move to convolutional neural networks. That is a 2D representation of the neural networks. And then we, I will introduce you how we use that into a robotic application. And then I will conclude the, the presentation. So the artificial neural network, instead of using a linear variables, it uses an exponential representation of our function. So instead of using, a, well, we, we use the sigmoid function that is represented in this way. It has a S shape. So one advantage of this representation is that the value of our, the output of our model of our function is going to be constrained to zero and one. So we can make a sum of many variables and it, the result is going to be finite. So we are not going to have an infinite uh, representation, but the representation of our output is going to be finite. So remember our linear regression in which we have uh, this uh, this linear representation, well, in this case, exponential, but in this uh, polynomials in this uh, aspect, but they are still linear. In the artificial neural network, it's exactly the same, but the idea is to use uh, sigmoid uh, functions instead of polynomial functions. So we can think of an artificial neural network as a uh, sigmoid uh, regression instead of a polynomial regression or a linear regression. So having that in mind, we can apply exactly the same techniques that I mentioned before. We can propose a weight, we can propose a sigma function, and then we can measure the output, measure the error of the output with respect to the expected output, and then introduce that error in the model in a recursive way and adjust these values. So we do that uh, for uh, all our data, and we will have a, a representation that is well adjusted to, to that data. So keep that in mind. Uh, an artificial neural network is just a sigmoid function uh, regression. So it's a kind of generalized additive model, and we can apply all our statistical tools to, to that representation. So we can have, a, for one input, we can have several values of the weights in the, in the sigma representation, just that we have a x, x squared, x cubed, and so on in the linear regression. So we can have a sum of sigma It's going to give us a more complex representation of our data. We can have as many representation as we want and the function is, is becoming more uh, complex. But the idea is the same. We have a sigma representation with a weight and we adjust the, those values with respect to the output. The same, we can have as many uh, values, uh, as many functions as we want. And at the end, 
this going to, to, be, to create a more complex representation. So what we are doing here is a kind of a regression in our data, but using sigma functions instead of polynomial functions. So it's, the, the concept is very easy, but very powerful. We can have multiple variables as an input data, so we can to create more complex models. So we can have humidity and temperature as the input to predict the rain. Well, we can have as many inputs as we have, as we want, and we can have a 2D representation, 3D representations, and in a space representation. So basically, a neural network is that we have a number of inputs. We have uh, some functions. In this case, we don't have polynomial functions. We have a, a sigmoid function that we adjust when we have an output and we adjust the, the values in the variables in the model, in the sigmoid functions, depending on the error in the output. So let's see how, well, the terminology is like this. In an artificial neural network, we have an input layer that is our data. We have some hidden layers that are our sigmoid functions. And we have an output layer that is going to be our weight. So let's check this case study, the Hanovit in Digital Recognition Problem. So we have the task to give these images try to define which uh, number they represent. So we have all that uh, data. We use the MNIST database that uh, consists of 60,000 uh, handwritten images for training and 20,000, I think. I I don't remember well, but like 20,000 images for test. So we are talking about the number of thousands of images of numbers in our input data, data set. So please keep in mind the, the big amount of uh, data that we need to make a, a regression. So the input is like that. We have some uh, values in color, shape, and uh, intensity, and so on. And the task is to classify all those values depending on some uh, criteria to a given uh, number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. How do we do that? Well, the input uh, image is a 28 by 28, uh, black and white uh, array. So we have like this, we convert it into a vector. So we have a matrix, we convert it into a vector. So we have all the 28 by 28 pixels in, in this way. That's our input data. We have uh, some sigmoid functions that we adjust, and then we have uh, a multivariable, multivariate uh, So given the input, it is going to give zero, a lot of zeros and only one, one in the output class. So it should be a zero vector except for the number six in this case, that is the input the data. And at the end, we want something like this. Uh, to classify all the input information according to the properties uh, given by the model. So if we use, uh, well, uh, if we use something, a representation like this, in which we have one input layer, one uh, hidden layer, and what um, output layer is going to give us some kind of performance. If we increase uh, the number of hidden, hidden layers like this, the performance might change and the representation is going to change as well because this function 
is not a function of the input data, but is a function of the of a representation of the input data. So it's a second level representation of the input data. And we can create more, more representations and we can go move to the deep learning world. So what does deep learning means? It means to start introducing a lot of hidden layers in between the input and the output. So we introduce three, four, five hidden layers. We are moving to the deep learning a world. It means deep because we stop using one single representation and we move to a, a bit more complex world. What is the advantage or disadvantage of using this kind of representation? Well, in the regression model, we propose our function and then we feed our data given that function. So we can measure how well the, the model fits that function, and also which parameters are important in our model representation. In the case of artificial neural networks, we don't have all, all, uh, that information. We only have a, a very complex model that is telling us that the, those values are going to give us the, the best response. But we don't know uh, the, the relationship between the input and the output. So we are gaining some uh, properties in accuracy, but we are losing a lot of uh, value power in, in representation, in, in interpretation. So we cannot interpret our model anymore. We can use it for any task we have, but we cannot answer the question why this model is working. And that's one of the drawbacks in the use of artificial neural networks but they are still very, very powerful. So if you are not interested in the interpretation of your model and you only want to create a model that works, this is a useful tool. So now we are all experts on artificial neural networks. And as we saw, they are like a, a sigmoid a regression, right? So it's a generalized additive model that uses a sigmoid representation for each of the parameters as a function uh, representation. And then we create a lot of sum, well, of sum so the input data given that the representation and the process representation in the hidden layer. So we can create very complex models using this uh, generalized additive uh, representation. And we can fit it using a lot of data. So the important thing here is we need a lot of data if we have a lot of variables. So in general, in the statistics, if you have one variable, you need uh, about 10 uh, values, 10 input data to adjust that uh, variable. So if your neural network has 10 uh, million neurons, you will need a uh, 100 uh, million uh, input data values. So think about that when you want to use this kind of representation. To, to include all the variability on your model, you will need at least 10 times uh, the number of neurons in your uh, model to say that the representation is, is valid. Now there are some techniques that allow you to have uh, those uh, uh, neural networks uh, train it with less uh, data, but yeah, they are kind of translating and so on, but we will not talk about that. So remember that in the artificial neural network representation, we transform our image from the 2D world to a 1D vector. So we take each row and put it in a vertical way, then the next row and concatenate it to the vector and so on. While it was useful for our artificial neural network representation, we are losing a lot of 2D uh, information. The 2D information uh, is very value, valuable and we, we can use it uh, to improve our prediction uh, 
how can we do that? Well, let, let, let's see. So we can, one way is like this, each uh, pixel in our array is uh, now uh, represented as an input neuron. So instead of having the input neurons in a vector way, we have them in a matrix uh, representation. Then we, the hidden neurons is just a linear combination of a small region in our uh, image. So in the previous representation, we use the whole vector as an input to a neuron. In this case, we only use a, a small region of the image as an input to a, our a neuron. So we reduce the linear space and increase the 2D space. And we do that for all the neurons in our uh, image, like this. What is the advantage of this? Is this that we are uh, learning some spatial relationships in our pixels. So we are learning, for example, one uh, layer is learning to recognize all the, or the diagonal uh, arrays in, in our image. So now that is going to learn all these uh, top points, the other these, these lines and, and so on. So we are dividing our representation in several 2D uh, filters. So we can have as many hidden layers as we want, and each layer is a, a 2D filter. So each layer is, with this layer is going to mark a one if it sees this pattern. This layer is going to turn on if it sees this pattern and so on. So we are now filtering different patterns, and then we can put these four patterns in another neural network, and if this uh, neuron sees all these four patterns, it's going to say that we are seeing a number one. So those uh, small representations are introduced to another series of uh, neurons. So these neurons are going to combine these uh, partial representations and are going to tell us, okay, I saw these four uh, parts of a number, and if I combine them, I can tell you that I am seeing a number zero. And then we have the output zero, one, two, three, four, five. So this, uh, this is the input image. From the input image, we divide it into a series of 2D, 2D filters. Each 2D filter is going to tell us on a to the spatial relationship between the pixels. And having a combination of those uh, filters in these layers, we are going to have a, a representation. So the combination of the filters so in the input image is going to give us uh, our output. And we can go as deep as we want. So we can introduce several filters and we are again moving to deep learning. In deep learning, we have a lot of uh, layers, in this case, uh, uh, to represent our, our image. So you can see that this small image is going to be represented by a series of uh, 2D filters and uh, combination layers and these layers and, and so on, right? So it's very, big representation for this small image. So um, the interpretation is very hard, but the application is very powerful. So it depends on what do you want, accuracy or uh, interpretability. So you have to decide that when you choose to, want to use one or another model. So one idea of how they work is like this. So if you want to detect a face given an image, so you can, each of the filters I show you are going to answer one of these questions. Is there an eye in the top left? Is there an eye in the top right? 
if there are nodes in the middle, if there are mouths at the bottom, if there are hair on top. And depending on the output of these uh, layers, the combination of all, of all of them are going to answer this question. Is this a face or not? And we can go deeper by increasing the, the level of interpretation in this uh, in each layer. For example, is there an eye in the top left? We can divide it into several layers, like is there an eyebrow? Is, are there eyelashes? Is there an iris? And this question, answering these questions is going to tell us if is there an eye in the top left. So that's one interpretation of a convolutional neural network as a combination of uh, layers that filter some spatial information in our image. And as I told you, we can go as deep as we want. So this first layer is going to uh, give us uh, some filters. Then the second layer is going to combine those filters to answer some questions. And then this, the next layer I'm going to combine the previous information to answer more specific questions and so on. So I have some examples of this uh, representation. Now that we are experts in convolutional neural network, we can understand though this example. So the first one is uh, open pose. This is a A library, a public library used to detect uh, the position of a person. It will tell us all the joints and the facial expressions in, in this person. So the important thing here is that we used uh, a lot of input images to create this representation. So the training data set is uh, very high. And given that training data set, we can infer for a new image, given all the previous evidence, what are the joints in that image. So please keep in mind that a neural representation is just an average response given the input data. If you give a different data set, of course, the, the average representation, the average uh, output is going to differ. So keep it in mind, if a neural network is working, it is working for a very specific uh, data set representation. So in neural networks, the data set is, is very important. But look, we have uh, several applications of this uh, data set. Also, this is impressive, the, the speed of, of the response. Another interesting application is this one, in which we have uh, This is for visual localization. It is created by Alex Kendall from Cambridge University. So the task here is given an input data, I should to define where this image was taken. So for example, if I give this image as an input data, it's going to tell me that a similar image is this one, even though it is different scene, this image was taken from this point of view. This is what the uh, neural network is telling me. If I give this input image, it's telling me, okay, this image was taken from this point of view. Or if I give a different image, it's going to tell me that. So we can use uh, visual localization for a uh, 2D uh, representation given an input data. So this is very interesting how powerful this uh, uh, 
approach is because you can see here uh, they are repairing here, but this part is visible, so the neural network was able to recognize the, the place. But the important thing here is this, the data. Again, the data, the data, and the data. If we try to download it, this is only for a single data set. It takes five gigabytes of images to uh, recognize places around a, a King College uh, area. So for each area, we have different, for the street, for example, Cambridge Street, we have 10 gigabytes of data. So again, data, data, and data is very important when you are uh, trying to use this generalized uh, regression. Six gigabytes and so on. So another, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, you can access to TensorFlow uh, page and you can start developing online your own solution. So you want to to start uh, using neural networks and you don't have a very powerful uh, system, you can uh, do that to, through this uh, uh, page. So I, I want to show you this. Well, this is the web page. You go to the C demos and I like this one. Uh, well, the input data consisted of uh, is it? Uh, the recordings of 1,400 performances by skilled pianists. And then they divided it into uh, 10 milliseconds. Well, uh, Well, they, they divided each sequence in, in following these rules into a series of segments, and then they measure what is the best or the more like, uh, likely uh, node, re depending on the previous node. So what is the, given all the recordings of the skilled pianist, given an input node, what is the most probable next node? And then given the combination of two nodes, what is the most likely probability of the next node? So given that they are having like, like having a conference of pianists and asking them which node they would select next given a segment of, of a song. For example, well, let, let's keep uh, listening to this. So this is a, an artificial, uh, well, a, a robotics concert, you can say that. It's a fully artificial intelligence uh, concert given the previous information. And you can see it sounds good, it sounds nice.
that that was a, a well, if, I don't know if you are familiar with the topic, but maybe this was your first artificial intelligence uh, piano concert. So welcome to the future. This, well, you can use the, this code and store uh, to do your own uh, experiments and playing with, with the, the code scene. in the TensorFlow uh, page. So again, the, input, the important uh, concept here is the input data. They use uh, 1,400 performances as an input data and divided it in small sequences to put as an input uh, in the neural network. So please keep that in mind. So given that I have been telling you that the important thing here is data, data, and data, well, where can I have this data? So one option is this. So we can have a, a lot of, uh, for image processing, we can have a, a lot of representation uh, for object segmentation, uh, modeling, uh, more segmentation in, in occluded scenes, uh, this 3D modeling again, uh, and so on. So we can we have a lot of open source uh, data collections. So you don't need to have a, a computer uh, or a complex equipment there. You just need to come here, download the data set, and start training your own uh, neural networks for your specific task. This one for segmentic, semantic segmentation is also useful. So in semantic segmentation, we put the robot in a, in a room. The robot sees all the objects in it and then defines what kind of room it is. It's a living room, it's a bedroom, it's a kitchen. And so so it's, it's a very interesting problem. Well, more for of that. So we can also have a slam that is for uh, show you for spatial localization of the robot given a map. So we can use all this uh, information to make a robot uh, navigate in an environment using a uh, neural network. And uh, with synthetic data uh, and so on. We can, we can have a lot. Uh, if you are uh, uh, you want uh, to apply this for human interaction, but well, there are also data sets uh, with that respect. So one uh, interesting, uh, well, this is for cooking. One interesting uh, data set is for hand uh, manipulation. That's also very, very interesting how, how to find the fingers positions. Like this one, no? how, how to find the finger position and try to, to interpret uh, the for grasping and, and so on. So there are a lot of data. This is for face recognition and so on. So there are a lot of data. There are a lot of uh, free libraries. So the next step is just to link those uh, together and start doing very cool uh, projects. So uh, questions this far? Maybe we can make a small pause before moving to our application. So no, no questions? Okay, so let's do as we did in the past uh, presentation, have a uh, five minutes uh, rest, and then go back to the last part of uh, the presentation in which I will introduce you how we apply all this uh, information in a very specific task. 
that is a, a map compression. So see you in five minutes. Okay, so now it's um, 9.51, so we will see all of you again in uh, 9.55 or 56. Right, so um, for the time being, like um, everyone can take a break and um, if you have any question, yeah, please feel free to write in the group chat, then we will try to interact with you. Yeah, I can see like many news um, people actually just join or they join after the introduction. So welcome to this uh, invited lecture by um, RoboCup at Home Education Online Classroom. So today we have Luis to uh, introduce um, the topic World Representation Through Artificial Neural Network and Introduction. And we see yeah, a lot of very interesting um, application. Uh, particularly on how to use this uh, all this um, data uh, for various kind of um, application. We can see like the application range is uh, very wide. We can see a lot, not just robotics, but a lot of um, application can be done. So um, maybe a question from me to Louis: Like, um, have you have any projects that uh, use utilize this free um, data set? Uh, in your in your development, do do you have any example that you have um, personally involved? Yes, I am using right now uh, the YCV dataset. Okay, OpenCV dataset. I see. No, y YCV. This one. Oh, YCV. All right. Okay. So this is for the object recognition. Yep. And I am trying to find the best uh, training uh, technique uh, for to improve the performance in service mm -hmm. robots. Because well, in a household, uh, the changes on uh, light and position and so on uh, is very, very high. So I, uh, I want to introduce all those variables into the training model in order to see which one is, is better. Okay, okay, so just to uh, as an introduction to uh, people that are not involved in RoboCup at home. So in RoboCup at home, we actually have a big challenge in order to, to train or to teach the robot able to recognize household item. So we know that in, in every one house, we have very, I mean, like a big quantity of um, uh, items and objects around our house. So how to actually identify all of them, especially in, in, in our competition, we have um, teams come from various countries. So um, even the same Coke, Coke can, I mean a can of a Coke, the, the packaging will be varies. I mean, um, if you compare some that you bought in um, um, Japan, and also if you compare to the one bought in US and so on, the branding, the wording, the design, the color will be different. But for us, human being is um, quite, intuitive we can recognize that it is a, a cook hand but how to let robots to understand uh, or to recognize so pattern matching is no longer sufficient for this kind of application and that's why in robocup at home particularly we use a lot of um, deep learning technique in order for the robots to do uh, object recognition so um i think louis yeah. just show you this ycb benchmark which is a very a popular benchmark that we use in our competition or our activities and yes maybe like Luis if you have any more experience that you can share regarding the usage of this YCB. Yeah actually I am working on this let me find the link okay. I am exploring the, the best strategies using a virtual representation of the robot. So one big problem in robot competitions is that uh, we have to train the, the objects in situ. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's very, very challenging mm -hmm. because the objects are, uh, are, are uh, sometimes we need a lot of data to train them, right? Yeah. So what we want to do is something like this. We create a 3D model of the object 
and put it in a virtual uh, environment, in a virtual robot, and then use the robot to train the object in a virtual environment. So we can collect a lot of data uh, virtually using real objects. And then we use them as an input data into the robot and just fine tune the, the neural network using uh, real images. So yeah, the collection of real images is now uh, small. And we rely on the virtual representation of the, of the world. So what simulator is this, by the way? Is it the Toyota simulator? Yes. OK. The, 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 the. So um, for, for, for those who um, are not so familiar with uh, the system, so Luis just show a simulator that the robot inside the one in white color is the Toyota HSR, human uh, support robot. And, and uh, come together with this uh, hardware or, or step, uh, plat robot platform from Toyota, it actually has a, a simulator that you can simulate um, before you actually work on the real robot. But um, a uh, question from me, Luis. So how actually yes. you want to get the model in the simulator that represent the actual real thing? It's a point cloud of uh, three points. So we have a concatenated point cloud, but we use for that uh, the upper camera. Then we have a series of views of the object uh, using some trigonometry. We can concatenate it and Oh, okay. So which means you 3D scan the real object and create the virtual model. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's very interesting. I, I think like, you can share more on this in the next class. <laughs> if we can. <laughs> sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. Maybe some practical uh, solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For... So how you actually like obtain, I mean like first how you actually set up the, the experiment system, then how you actually obtain the data and then how you learn from the data and eventually you create the application in real world. So I think like, okay, maybe like um, uh, not familiar, people that are not familiar at home might not feel or don't understand why it's so interesting about this. But for me, um, personally, uh, I'm also one of the teams that participated in um, RoboCup at home. And I feel like this whole uh, workflow and also this whole development is very interesting and very important for our development and also for our research work because it is really really as we say it's very very hard to get the data especially good data because like if you fit bad data into the learning you will actually get not a good result so how to get good data is actually very challenging no matter how great your algorithm without good data you actually can't make the system uh, behave or perform well Okay, so Luis, we really passed And after the, the data, we yeah. have this. Okay, yeah, so this is how you get data. the data. Right? No, well, this is how we use the data. Okay. Once we have the data, we, have, we know this is an apple and we put it in a, close to the similar objects and so on. Okay, so, so this is the Toyota HSR robot. Yeah. And currently this lab is uh, in Tamagawa, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's how we use the data. And so, so important thing here was, as we mentioned, data. Okay. Okay, so this is for the shopping grocery task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Luis, we already passed the, the break time. So you okay. can resume your lecture as uh, you, you have planned. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so now I will show you one very specific application of this uh, uh, approach to the uh, map compression task. So the idea of using, uh, well, first I show you that we can have a map representation, well, a word representation using a lot of input data and then extracting the, the most representative information from the data and the most repeated information. So we can uh, have a word representation taking an average of the most representative and uh, repetitive information in the input data set. But sometimes uh, that information is uh, not uh, useful for a specific task. 
So our wall representation can be very, very accurate, but also we can be over-representing uh, the, the world, the environment, for a very simple task. So we aim at introducing the task in the world representation uh, loop uh, and try to reduce the, the representation or, or the size of the representation. So why do we do that? Well, uh, as a small robot, if we have a case, a small robot like a quadcopter, the computer in there in it is very small and the reaction should uh, be fast. So having a very complex map representation, we prevent uh, other functions to operate while accessing to a specific data is going to be very slow. So one way to increase the speed of the, this kind of robots is using a smart representation. And in the case of service robots, like the one in the image, is the map well, or the navigation is only one of the many tasks the robots should do. So having a, a big map, it can prevent the robot to perform in parallel all the other tasks that the robot should do. For example, if the robot is navigating inside of a house and we want the robot to move from room A to room B and uh, using this map and at the same time uh, avoiding collisions with the humans or objects and at the same time finding the human that requested some task and at the same time, the robot is holding an object and we should prevent the robot to drop the object and so on. So this uh, uh, cumulative uh, task uh, can interfere with each other if one of them is taking all the computational power. That's why we, we want small map representations that can both that be enough to perform the task. So in our work, uh, we use a, a neural network as an idea of a map representation inside of a robotic brain. As I mentioned before, a, a neural network representation is an average a output of, of the input data. So we can assume that the model given by a neural network is somehow uh, averaging of the representations that might have uh, or might, might come from the, the input data. So we argue that this uh, CNN or this uh, convolutional neural network representation of the input data is a, is a well, uh, a good, uh, accurate uh, representation in a robot uh, application. So we don't say that is the best representation, but we say that is a good uh, average representation. So if we have uh, many models, uh, some of them are going to converge to this uh, CNN representation. So having that in mind, we search or we look for ways to compress the information given uh, a CNN representation. So we use uh, this data set, this the seven scenes red kitchen data set. This is from Microsoft. Uh, this is just to show you the data set. It consists of 11 sequences in, in many rooms. So they ask a human to take the camera and move the camera around the, the room. And uh, they collected the 3D information and also the position of the camera using some uh, sensors. So the input data is a sequence of images and the 3D trajectories of the camera. We use this data set as a, a training data set. This, is, this comes from a 
and RGB uh, the camera, so we have color information, depth information, and 3D position of, of the, each of the pixels. We use those uh, variables as an input into a convolutional neural network. So we can have a several layers convolutional neural network, one for the colors, one for the depth, and one for the points. So an input image consists of, of this array. An output image consists of a pose. A position and orientation. So when somebody mentions pose, it is divided into position, that is uh, the spatial position and the orientation of the camera. So we, we will have, a, well, we have this error function in which we compare the uh, output of the neural network with the real output, and then we adjust the parameters to have the minimum error. So P is the real position, P prime is the one given by our presentation. So we have uh, tested it like this. We use a B G, G uh, neural network representation. I didn't have it here. But well, this is, we first tested uh, which kind of input data is more uh, important to represent the, the world. So we tested the depth information only. We tested the an image in grayscale. We tested the only the 3D points. The color image. We tested uh, this one in uh, as we use BGG. We first tested training it in uh, object detection task, and then we fine tune. Uh, the neural network using our data. So this is a very common technique that we use a pre-trained neural network in another task. We just change some values to adjust that neural network in our task. Then we use a combination of a color and depth and color and point cloud. So we found that using a pre-trained neural network in a different task and then adjusting it to our task uh, gave us the least error. So we have some outputs like, like that. E for color image, for uh, well, color image in a pre-trained neural network, color image only, and 3D points only. So we can see that the best uh, representation is given by uh, a pre-trained uh, color uh, image. We use the TUM's uh, long coffee sequence. TUM is another uh, data set that is very common and very, very useful. So this one. So again, I am uh, focusing here in the data sets because you, you need uh, uh, them to create a very accurate uh, solution. So if you go here, you will see all the sequences. And you can see they have one giga, two gigas, and so on. They, they are like, like uh, this, right? Oh, I need flash for it. If you go there, uh, you, you, you will see all the data we use. Okay, we also, when we compare, once we define that the color information in a pre-trained uh, neural network is the best uh, representation of uh, our world, we compare it with several other uh, representations. So we have a, a BGG a neural network, that is a very common uh, neural network, and it has few, well, fast, medium, and slow uh, sizes, then 16 and 19 uh, hidden layers. Then we have PostNet that is very heavy, and ScoreForest that is uh, uh, 
it is not a neural representation, it is a random forest representation, it's more like a, a linear regression. So we are comparing sigmoid regressions with a linear regressions. And then we use of SLAM, and that is a different approach is a 2D uh, representation. So we can see that nowadays uh, linear representations have very small error, and of the SLAM, that is a 2D uh, fair uh, SLAM system, that is kind of state of the art, the monocular uh, localization has the least error. So as I mentioned, uh, neural representation, one of the problems is that we don't understand the, the model, so we cannot adjust it. We cannot introduce pre, uh, previous knowledge in the localization task into the model because we don't know the model. On the other hand, uh, this uh, linear representation or this uh, visual representation, they are very well defined and we can adjust the parameters according to our previous knowledge on the problem. That's why they give us the least error. So uh, maybe it would increase with a better understanding of neural networks and uh, more data. So if we had uh, more and more data, maybe someday this uh, approaches are going to get close to uh, conventional approaches. But at the moment, conventional approaches are uh, the state of the art in this uh, given task. But uh, there are now, uh, there is a lot of conference uh, uh, focusing on this. But if we focus on the top uh, part, we can see that uh, small representations are giving us a, a small error as well as a big representation. So we can compress, and we can gain some uh, uh, storage information by using a smaller representation without losing uh, accuracy. Well, we use the uh, PostNet and TUM and CNC's data sets. So we compare uh, these approaches with a lot of uh, data sets. So this is the, the idea. Another idea, is once we have a given a neural network, if we use one sequence, the error is high. If we start adding some more data, the, the error is reduced. And if we start adding data and data and data and data and data, we can see we are converging to minimum, but we still are having a, a less error. So again, the data is, is crucial for this task. And we can see that uh, uh, representations with uh, a lot of, of depth uh, are the best uh, representation with the least error. But these uh, representations with, with this smaller representation are also having a, a good performance. So it depends on, on your application. If your robot has a few memory, you can uh, lose some uh, accuracy but you can gain a lot of space because the, this is like four layers and this is like 19 layers. So you are storing a lot of, of space, saving a lot of space just by including more data and using less uh, neurons. So uh, we have this uh, representation is as, as previous. If we have only one uh, training uh, sequence, one input data, this is the, the localization we have. The green one is the correct one. The red one is the one given by uh, our uh, system. No, the, sorry. The red one is the training sequence. The green one is the, uh, the test sequence. And the blue points are the points that we got. So, as uh, we get uh, more and more uh, training data here in red, the blue points are getting closer to the green line. So again, the more data, the more accurate uh, our system uh, becomes. So for future work, I will uh, want you to, to introduce this uh, 
uh, data sets again. We have more and more uh, data here. So this is the University of Michigan uh, North Campus Long Term Vision and Data. So this data set consists of this. This is a, a mobile robot uh, moving around a, a big campus in the, a whole year. So it moves in, in several, uh, oh, well, here we have 27 seasons. So they change the route, they change the, the, the day, the hour, and, and everything. So they collected a lot of uh, information of the same area, given different uh, lighting conditions, and days of seasons, and so on. So the robot is like this. They have a sensor here, cameras, and so on. And the robot was uh, moved in this uh, scenario. So they have different seasons, different lighting conditions, different uh, areas, and, and some different routes, and all, this is all the data they collected. So this is for 15 months, 27 seasons, and the information that they have is a LiDAR sensor, omnidirectional camera, uh, and uh, position sensor, uh, orientation, odometry, and, and, and stuff, right? So they have all, all that information. Obviously, it's a lot of information. Their size for one single uh, session is, is very large. 100 gigabytes for this one, uh, and so on. So you can uh, put all this information in a neural network and then try to train this network to uh, localize uh, the robot in that area, uh, given a new image. Just uh, I show you with the Cambridge uh, approach, but uh, obviously having a computer that can process like two teras of information is, is, is yeah, less likely to, to have. So we need to start using uh, smart uh, representations to use the least data that can give us the, the same performance. So that's one of the idea of using this, this smart representation. Try to use one that allows us to train all this data in a shorter time and also selecting the, the best uh, input data. So, but this is this kind of uh, data set is very useful for the long term representation. This is a very common problem where uh, we need uh, to localize a robot in an area independently of the time of the day and the season and the, the place, of course, and the orientation and so on. But this data set is very powerful and very useful if you are interested in, in that task. This is very common for outdoor robots, and, and yeah, I invite you to, to use it if you have some problems that involve uh, long term localization. This is also for long term localization. Uh, we use, uh, well, th there are some standard tests that you can enter, and th they have these sets, and they have this kind of input data for the same place in different uh, seasons, winter, spring, uh, autumn, uh, fall, uh, summer and fall, right? So it is, well, they appear in GDPR 2020, so this is very recent uh, data set. So again, they have this amount of images and so on. So a lot of, of data sets and and information, right? So if you want to make a, or to create a robot that is able to localize itself in a given place independently of the uh, day of the year, 
well, you can use uh, this data set. And if you have any more uh, tasks different than that, you can use, uh, well, you can enter to this awesome SLAM data sets for robot localization. So basically, well, there are several categories, odometry, mapping, press recognition, localization, and perception. So odometry means uh, if I move the robot one meter, the system should tell me that I move the robot one meter. Mapping is just to, from an unknown environment, uh, create a, a 3D representation. That is the task that I show you. Press recognition is similar to the previous, uh, consequence of the previous. So given a map, I should uh, tell where the robot is. I, I showed you some of this in the previous presentation. Localization and, and perception. So the, this is, these are all the, uh, data sets that you can access. So now a days having a data is not a problem. So you can start doing your applications and maybe somebody has the, already the, the data. If that is not the case, you will need, if you have a task, you might face a two, two problems. One, a, choosing the best uh, representation, and second, in collecting the data. So data collection is also a very interesting area, and it depends a lot on the statistical designs and, and so on. But for, for now, we can start with some of these uh, data. So we introduce a first approach, uh, so uh, CDMAP representation and compression for camera relocalization. Then we observe that when the training data is reduced, the architecture it plays a crucial role. If we have a, a small data, few data, uh, we need to have a architecture that fits the size of the data set. So if we have a very, very complex uh, architecture, and we have a, a small data, the architecture is going to overcome the, the data and the random values are going to prevail. So we need to, to have a small uh, representation if we have a few data. Also, we can have a, an architecture that was pre-trained before and that can solve some of those problems. Uh, Okay, we also see that if we keep introducing data to our array, uh, our representation is uh, improving. So this is very, very uh, good because we can start uh, with a robot with the current information. And at the same time that we are using the robot, we can start collecting more information and introducing it to our representation. So our robot will keep learning all the time. And while the robot is learning, uh, the accuracy is increasing, and uh, the, the performance is also increasing. So we can have a robot that learns all the time. And well, that's the, the the end of this part of the presentation. I think it was faster than I thought, but yeah, we have time for some questions. Hey, thank you, Luis. Thank you for the very interesting and also I think you cover a lot. Um, okay, so yeah, for all the participants, if you have any question, please feel free to write in the group chat and we will discuss. Uh, if you have any question, even beginner question, like so how, 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 how can we start it? Uh, how, how to how to get started with, with this kind of development and so on or are you new with um, machine learning or deep learning or anything yeah feel free to to post up uh, your question and we can discuss directly with Luis right so while waiting for you to write down the question so maybe like I, I can uh, ask a question uh, for for so Luis you have shown us like uh, a lot of approach and also a lot of data set but for example, like now as a beginner team, um, it is actually not 
possible for us to use those data, especially for navigation, because we don't live there. <laughs> so even like we, we, we use the data set, we put it in our robot, but we can't test because we don't have that environment. So what do you advise, for example, like if we want to start something small first, uh, how can we get started? What is the requirement in terms of like what kind of sensor data that we need in order to do this kind of um, um, development? Okay, so particularly like two, two applications that you point out that closely related to our robotics um, um, development. First is for the object recognition, another one is for the navigation. So what kind of requirement that we need to have or we need to build up uh, before we can start doing this kind of um, development? The problem, as I mentioned, with neural networks is that we need a lot of data. Yeah. So the first uh, thing is uh, defining the problem, okay, subject recognition, and the needs to solve that problem. So I need a lot of views of the object. So the one way is to take a picture with a normal uh, USB camera and then segment the picture in the, of the object in the image and change the background and so on. Because some standard uh, neural networks that you can use uh, now on, from the internet, like YOLO and so on, using a segmented uh, uh, image of the object that we want to, to recognize. So the, the first thing I would suggest is having that a system that allows you to crop the uh, interested image in, in, your, in your data set. So for that, OpenCV is very good. And there is a function that is called graph code that allows you to, to do that. Another very, very common solution to this is to have a, a background with a constant color, maybe like bright green, like in the green screen in the cinematography. So having this uh, background with a constant color and then you place your object in there and then the segmentation is much easier. You just uh, delete of the, uh, the parts with the constant color and keep the, the object that is different than that. So that's a, a very common approach. So as I, I mentioned, you can combine a, some, or you can use some pre-trained uh, neural network in another data set and then train your neural network in your data set using a few uh, images. That is going to, to reduce the data collection drastically. So you can, if you have 10 objects, you can take 100 views of each object. It's going to be like 1,000 images only. And then you use that uh, images into a pre-trained uh, data set in the Pascal data set or something like that. And then uh, you will have a neural network that works uh, pretty well uh, using a few data. So that's uh, another uh, advice uh, I can give you. Okay. Use a pre-trained yeah. neural network and use uh, background segmentation using a constant color background. Yeah, I think that is uh, quite feasible for even like beginner that start with um, what to learn about machine learning. So they can pick up like OpenCV or they can pick up um, YOLO. Uh, my team is using YOLO intensively a lot. And, and yeah, students start with um, how to generate the data, how to do annotation and, and all those things and try to, because YOLO come with some pre-trained uh, model and also we can use some um, model from the web. I mean, we can get some data set that we use. And some more for object, it is still possible we get something similar <laughs> for us to test. For example, like Coke can, mineral water bottle, these are the things that we were still able to get. And I found that even the pre-trained, without doing any learning, we, we just use the pre-trained and the accuracy is quite good. I mean, if you choose the correct uh, object. Okay, sure. yeah, I think that is uh, something that we can start with uh, uh, for beginner team uh, to, to follow what you have just said. So we have a question come in, All right? So um, it is about artificial uh, oh, okay. So AI and deep learning is a uh, computational heavy. So however, for mobile robot system, uh, we need to be light and not power hungry. So what kind of hardware software do you recommend to implement uh, AI deep learning on mobile robots? 
So do you have any the learning? The learning process is very, very heavy. Yeah, that, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, TensorFlow, uh, well, this, this page allows you to train the data set on the servers they have. So that's one solution. You can use uh, some external servers to do in the training. And then you can just install the, the final output of, you, of the model into your, your computer. Also, for, well, however, to use some neural network models, we might require some GPU power. So any computer with GPU it will work well. But well, yeah, as I mentioned in, uh, in the introduction, robots tend to do uh, several tasks at the same time. So each of those tasks might request access to the GPU. So what we propose here is to use a small representation. So it doesn't matter that the very big representation is going to give you a more accurate uh, performance, but you can have a smart representation to give you a similar performance but using much le less uh, data. So that's uh, my, my recommendation, e given that you have a PC with a constant power, a GPU, uh, some uh, memory related to, to that using a, a small representation. So try to, when you are training a, a neural network, try to train neural networks with several sizes and keep the one that has the smaller and best uh, performance. The smaller size and the best performance. So that's one, one recommendation I, I give you. But yeah, we, we need GPU. Uh, so in this case, in particular, without making any advertising, we use uh, L Alienware. For, I think anyone can, can be can be good. Yes, so Luis, that is in terms of software. Do you have any hardware in mind that, or you have any experience that what kind of uh, hardware that you use for those kind of processes? No, actually, I use the one provided in the laboratory, so it's always a GPU with 12 cores and so on. But yeah. Yeah, because we. Sometimes, we, yeah. yeah. Sometimes we use uh, the Amazon servers, but just yeah, yes, for very specific cases after we train. Well, what we do is we train in, in our computers uh, the. the require small mo models, smaller models uh, using only a part of the data set. So we divide the, the data set in a small part. We train our neural networks. We find the best representation. And then we train in a server the whole data set. After we decide which mod model is going to work best in a small part of the data set. So that's another recommendation. If you are doing a model selection. First, do it with a small part of the data set, find the best representation, and then train the whole data set only once. So if your, object, if your task is object recognition and you have 100 objects, find the best model using a small data set with 10 objects, find the best parameters that produce the, the best performance, and then train the whole data set using the, those parameters, that model. So that's another advantage to reduce the computational power, train or find the model, the best model in a small part of the data set, and then train only once in the whole data set. So referring to what you just said that I have a quite tricky question for you. It's like, so you, you say that we, 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 we can try with some small data set uh, at, in, in order to get the performance that we want. But actually, how do you think like how much data is enough? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's yeah, I understand it's, it's a tricky question. <laughs> mm -hmm. As I mentioned, one rule can be uh, well, it depends. If we consider a, a neural network as a regression model, and each of the neurons is a parameter that needs to be fit, we can multiply the number of neurons in your model times 10. 
to have the, the best uh, response. But sometimes uh, we have uh, one, a model with one million neurons, and, and yeah, we, we cannot uh, have 10 million input data. So yeah, it, it's, it depends on, on the task at hand. If you have pre-trained uh, neural networks with 1,000 images should be enough, but, but yeah, it, yeah it's, it's very tricky with that. There are now some approaches that use uh, one-shot learning. So you only need one image to learn. So yeah, the range is from one image to 10 million images. So it, yeah, it depends on, on the model a lot, so. I understand that, for example, like previously when I used YOLO, it actually synthesized the, the data from one image. I mean, it, it rotate, it, it enlarge, it, it, it do a lot of way to actually increase the number of data from just one image that we provide. Uh, yeah, you know, that uh, augmentation is also yeah, that, uh, one solution. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you input one image and then some rotation and uh, morphology transformation and so on uh, applied to, to the data set, we will increase that. Also, another trick is to change the background uh, of the segmented image, so you change the background like different uh, places of the house and so on, and that also will increase the, virtually increase the, the data set. Oh, okay. But, but yeah, it, yeah, how, how much is good? Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. that's a good question. But yeah, in general, it's 10 times the number of parameters in your model. 10, 10 times the number of parameters. So that is the rule of thumb that you use, okay. Okay, so yeah. you, you already show us like we can actually do the training on the cloud, which is for example like the, the, the way that you show us. Um, also, we can do the, the learning on our local machine, right? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. like, do you have um, some learning that you, you actually uh, conducted using, I'm not sure, like NVIDIA board or, or any uh, Jackson board or any things that you have used before? Yeah, I, I use the Jetsons to do the training I showed you in the experiments. Uh, which which bot? Jason PX2? No, I can't remember. It was in the laboratory, so okay. I don't remember the, the name, the, the model. But yeah, we use a, a local training for, for this uh, part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't remember the, the model. Yeah, but yeah, it was. So from my understanding is that once you train, actually, you can actually take the model and run it using a normal laptop, right? Mm, yes. So that, that actually we can reduce the, 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 not to say the burden, the resource. In the application, right. in the application yeah, you can reduce. The... Yeah. yeah, because normally like in my team, normally we will do the learning with a more powerful machine, but it's very bulky yeah. that we don't put on the robots. Then we, we use the model we run it on a smaller machine that we put on the robot. Sure. So usually that yeah. is the way to, to reduce. I mean, uh, because we're not able to, for example, we, I have a, uh, we have an Alienware, 17 inch. Uh, it's not possible to put that on our robot. <laughs> it's, it's too heavy. Maybe HSR is still fine, but if we have something like the turtle bot, it's, it's, it's too big compared to the robot. So we, yeah. will, we will use the AlienMed for the learning, I mean, the training of uh, the data. Then we will use the model on the robots. So usually we will do that, yeah. Yeah, we, we do that uh, as well. We train uh, offline and then we use the training model into the robot. And, and yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess like for, for that question, we, we really like share uh, with you like a few of our experience. So mm -hmm. maybe that is something that is uh, viable for you. So you just need a normal laptop at the end when you have a very nice trained um, model uh, or, your, or you have a very big data set, you can try to divide to train in the cloud or train in the supercomputer you have in your lab or server. Then after that, you just use the model, which is very small mm -hmm. uh, in your, I mean, relatively small in, uh, on your robots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one idea is if you have a very complicated model, try to train it or find the best parameters using a small part of the data set and then only train the, the big model few times in uh, servers or your, your computer. 
Yeah, so that, that's a very good trick because, yeah, sometimes you have to schedule the use of those computers and if you schedule it to find the best model, you are going to, to lose a lot of good time for, for obtaining the, the best model. So do you, how, how do you benchmark actually? How do you compare which one is the best model? Uh, well, for training, you need, well, you have some tuning parameters that you have to find, right? When you select the model. And for the model selection, we train several sizes models and we measure the error performance, basically. Mm -hmm. Which one gives us the, the least uh, error. If it is object detection, we have our test data set that consists of 1,000 images that we know what is the output and we, we just check the one that gives us the least error or the highest accuracy. I see. So you, you test the accuracy as well, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure like you test the, the, how to say, the, the confidence level of the detection or, or what, what? The detection, the... the High detection, the accuracy. Yeah, but okay, if so we have a big model, if we have a big model with seventy-eight accuracy, seventy-eight percent accuracy, and a smaller model with a seventy-four percent of accuracy, we keep the small model okay. because yeah, it's faster and lighter and so. So, uh, any more question uh, on the floor? So, if you have any question, feel free to write uh, in the in the uh, group chat windows. So, um, so we continue the discussion. So, from just now, we discuss is more on the object recognition, right? Object detection. But how about SLAM? So, just now you show uh, a lot of like those um, data set for navigation. I think those are for Visual SLAM, right? If I'm not mistaken. So which means yeah, SLAM is yeah. still as you can see now in the plot uh, in the in the table. Yeah, SLAM is still an open problem using a neural network because the accuracy is not as precise as a state of the art the monocular or stereo SLAM system. Yeah. So it's moving fast because we are having a bigger and bigger uh, data. But yeah, the, the accuracy is still not as good as the traditional method. So mm -hmm. I think this is also this is helpful because uh, we are trying to understand how neural networks work, and they try to introduce the knowledge on localization into the training process itself. So I have seen some approaches in which they use a uh, the information given by a standard monocular SLAM as an input to the neural network to increase the performance of the neural network itself. So this is like a two-way loop. So they use the, the monocular SLAM as an input to the SLAM system, to the CNN SLAM system, and then use the output of the SLAM system as an input to the monocular SLAM to improve the the, the the monocular SLAM system. So they, they, they use this uh, uh, collaboration between traditional and uh, convolutional neural network SLAM system. I see. It sounds complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that complicated. It's just using <laughs> the, the previous information into the neural network. So okay. one common is called CNN SLAM. And yeah, it's, it's moving oh, towards okay. that. I mean, like personally, I only use um, the normal SLAM, which is using uh, laser range finder instead of um, a, a visual SLAM. Because visual SLAM is, uh, for, for small system, it requires a lot of um, processing, especially to process the, 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 the images continuously on board. So it's, it's not easy. Okay, well, we have another question. So I'm not so clear about the concept of CNN. So is it possible that we accidentally use an appropriate for the application that we want and it won't achieve high accuracy no matter how long we train it? Uh, yeah. Okay, so... Like... Okay, yeah. Here, if we have a few data, it doesn't matter which model we use, like here. We are using several models. 
and we don't have a, the enough data, it doesn't matter which model we use, the performance is similar. Yep. And here, if we have enough data, the performance is different, given different models. So yeah, there are cases in which it doesn't matter the, the, which model we use, if we don't have the, if we don't ask the proper question, and we don't provide the uh, enough data. Mm -hmm. So it's the same problems as in any regression model. Uh, we can go to overfitting or underfitting. So if we have a, a lot of data and very small model, we can uh, overfit the model. So we have we keep providing data to the small model and we can overfit it. Or if we have a very big model and few data, we can underfit. So we will never adjust the model because we don't have enough data. So it's the same problems that you can have with a regression model comes to, to a CNN model or to a artificial neural network model in this case. Regarding this, um, the, the selection of appropriate data and so on, Luis, do you have any experience that you can actually uh, tell us some uh, example, for example? Yeah, the, for the Robocops, as I mentioned, we need to, well, we don't know the objects they are going to provide uh, until the day of the competition. So we uh, try to train those objects uh, in situ, always. But the, sometimes we just don't have uh, enough time, enough data, enough views. So yeah, at this moment, I am trying to design an automatic uh, camera motion uh, robot. Well, I am using a robotic arm to move the camera around the object to generate most of the views that I can have uh, in order to introduce the data set. Well, yeah, the experience for any team is always the same. We don't have uh, enough data to uh, train a accurate model. It doesn't matter if we use a convolutional network or our, our own implementations using some features or color features or geometry features or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's always time constraints. Uh, it's very challenging, but it's also improving this, this part of this area on data collection, how to collect uh, enough data in a very short time and how to decide which data is better than for, so for a specific task. Do you mean like, if, for example, like if we want to recognize something, but if we never train that data or that something that looks similar to that thing, before, the model will never able to detect that, that particular thing, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I have seen some approaches that is called, I mentioned the one-shot learning in which you show one image of the object, and I read something new that is about zero-shot learning, mm -hmm. in which given a series of uh, knowledge on your data set, for example, you know what is a horse, you say, you tell the robot, well, now I want you to find a zebra. A zebra is a horse, but with some black and white stripes. And then the robot, just by that definition, is going to be able to, to find a zebra. So this is called zero short learning. It's just a novel approach, but, but yeah, that's what this kind of competition is leading to, like training an object using the least information we have. It's very good, it's very interesting, but yeah, it's but, quite challenging. So. Uh, yeah, Luis, have you ever tried the GAN system, GAN? Uh, generative additive model? Uh, it's something like it will actually estimate between two things. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure how. <laughs> Uh, how to explain this? Um, it's, it's something very popular recently. Uh, it, it has a lot of variation. So, um, for example, like um, one project that worked under my um, in in my team is like we we try to recognize an object uh, in different condition. So, for example, like we have object A and B. So we try to learn how A look like in different condition. For example, in condition one, condition two, condition three. So that is what we learn. But then the challenge is to, to, to develop a system in order for the system able to recognize how B look like 
in a condition that we never seen before. No, I haven't addressed the problem. Sounds, sounds interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so that well, is well, yeah. something that um, uh, I, I can see. Yeah. I mean, this deep learning thing is uh, getting very interesting, uh, which means you, you can actually let the system to predict how something look like or how something behave uh, following how things change in another case. Oh. Yeah. I have seen some similar uh, approaches in which they use a simulator. So you ask a robot, for example, to take one object, and then they have a simulated representation of the robot itself and the object, and then they generate like 1,000 plans for performing the task, and then in the simulator, and then they perform the, in the real robot the best uh, approach, the best uh, solution for, the best simulated uh, solution for, for that single task. But yeah, maybe it's quite similar, but different. To that because they do that online. So you give the task and the robot uh, simulated a lot of, of solutions of the problem and then take only one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can have a lot of discussion on this. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you have any more questions, yeah, please welcome you to write on the group chat and we'll continue from what we, what, what we have here. So just now we talked about this uh, visual slam uh, and, and so on. So I actually come across one presentation, one keynote actually, to compare between um, the, the, the classic um, SLAM system with uh, distant uh, data and another one with uh, visual SLAM, which is purely on, on, on images. And they said that in long run, or just now you said we have the large scale long-term navigation. Uh, they said when we are dealing with large scale and long-term navigation, Visual slam is actually require less data because it compare, for example, if you have a LIDAR that scan, that get all the 3D sensor uh, data throughout the whole course, and that amount of data is actually more than the visual or, or the images uh, throughout the whole, the, whole, the, whole, the whole course. Because I think like human, we are actually using visual slam, right? <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Human are usually visual slam. We, we don't measure all the distance and remember all those things. That's why we cannot generate the map in our mind. But we can we can recall like in any point how the surrounding look like. So that, that is how um, visual slam actually happened in our brain. Uh, so that is how human navigate. But um, that is a very interest. That was a very interesting uh, talk. But come back to uh, what you just uh, explained or what you just shared with us, it's like, but how about like not the long-term or not the large scale navigation? Do you still um, think that uh, it will be beneficial if we try to uh, explore the, the neural network approach or, or the CNN, that, the approach that you, you introduced to us in a more small, environment. For example, we build service robot. So important is like we want the robot to move around our house or maybe one shopping complex which is not very big, for example, uh, a few shops or, or maybe like in school or in um, hospital that not really in big scale. So do you think in this kind of condition, it is still beneficial if we, uh, instead of using just the normal, you know, the 2D map with uh, the, the laser range finder, uh, by adding all this um, visual slam, do you think it will actually help in any sense? Mm, yeah, I think yes. Uh, well, I don't think uh, this kind of system is going to substitute one and another, but they are going to complement each other. So always 3D, because in 2D scan laser, we are losing uh, the, the one dimension. So for obstacle avoidances, it's crucial to have the, the 3D information of the objects. Okay. And, and yeah, the, the geometry of the objects also, because sometimes we have a, a table. The table is based with two, four foot, okay. but okay. they are very, very small. And the robot doesn't see the space in between the, the feet of the table, and they need to well, they think it's an empty space, but if you go to the 
Mm -hmm. The dimension you will see a table in the air, and then you, you will take us an occupied space. So the information is in there. So that's why it's, it's necessary for, for us. Mm -hmm. So also the visual information allows to have a semantic uh, detection. Okay, yeah. Se semantic mapping. So we can say, I, I have seen a dynamic, uh, well, dynamic fusion that is a, a, the next, next step of Kinect Fusion in which they do a semantic localization. Well, they, they create a 3D map uh, using the extion then they do some semantic localization. So they tag all the 3D objects inside the 3D map. So this is a table, this is a chair, this is a uh, whatever. And then they uh, provide using the, the tags given by a CNN that do some object recognition. Mm -hmm. They have the objects and they, they add some physical properties to each of the objects. And they use that physical properties, especially dynamic properties to into the objects to uh, give those objects some weight in the localization problem. So if I see that this is a chair and I know that a chair usually changes of place depending on how the last user uh, let it. So I can give a small weight in the localization problems. And if I found a desk and a wall, uh, something like I know it's going to be there, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It has a, a long, a bigger weight in the localization task. So the, 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 this combination is very, very interesting and, and very useful in, in this case for long-term localization in indoor scenarios. I can provide, well, like with the neural network, I can find the objects. I can provide some uh, dynamics and I can improve my localization, my long-term localization by uh, giving these weights to different dynamic uh, levels in each of them. No, yes, you, I, I totally agree with you that it is, will be very uh, good or it's a great advantage for the, for the robot able to recognize the scene. I mean, like, so that the robot know, like, okay, currently I'm in the, in the living room or in the hallway, and all these things, and for um, uh, object avoidance and so on. So you can actually recognize, I mean, the furniture, and you can actually uh, distinguish like people walking around and so on. And this information is very useful, uh, especially for narrow passage um, navigation. I mean, when we have a lot of people that, that move around, for, for indoor mobile robots application. So, uh, yeah. So also for, for localization, if you see objects on, the, on a desk, mm -hmm. you don't use the, those objects as a special, special cues. You delete those objects in your mapping process because you know that an object in a desk mm -hmm. is going to change position. So okay. you delete those objects from your map and you just keep the, the big objects that have a zero dynamics. So, you, you delete the chair, but you keep the desk and the wall and some uh, pictures on the wall and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they, they are introducing this object recognition in the map, in the localization problem, because you can add some dynamics to the objects, delete the objects with a high variance in position in the, in the time, and keep only those objects that you know have a more contact, constant uh, position in space independently of the time. Yeah. Well, very nice uh, discussion. <laughs> um, um, and, and I think like we actually open up more topics that, that we, we, we might have chance to ask you for more uh, sharing section like this after this. <laughs> okay, okay, so um, our, our time is also um, almost up. It now is uh, 11, so we, we estimate this session to be two hours. So um, we will, I would like to call for uh, we will end this session and if let's say we have more um, how to say interest to talk about other topics or for those um, in the, the audience if you would like to hear more you can always like feedback to us so okay so over here is a Google form that um, you can actually feedback to us yeah I'll, 
I will you fill up the form maybe later. Don't worry, you just keep the, keep the link you know, with, with all this particular as well. So just in case you miss a link, but maybe you want to know more information about uh, the, the like um, how Louis made the object recognition or, or you can always feedback to us. Uh, the more feedbacks here or, or the more persuasive for us to actually persuade us to, to arrange something that is more, feel free to, to feedback to us. Uh, and even you can write for, for today's uh, the session today. Really? And, and it's a, a huge amount of uh, information you have shared with us. And I think all this information are very practical as well and how to do the things. I think it, it is very uh, interesting and also it's very valuable, um, not just for uh, us that working on, on similar field, but I think for all the audience that work on vision, work on other field, uh, even work on machine learning or AI, you might find uh, interesting and useful for you. Okay, cool. so um, let us, um, thanks Luis for, for your sharing today. Thanks a lot. And we uh, honored and appreciate you for to sharing all this information for these two weeks. And we look yeah, forward, no right? So just in case that later. Okay, okay. No problem. Right. So Thank you. So if you, if you, um, so I, I will ask the audience, like, please um, send a thank you in the group chat for Luis. So while in the meantime, I will um, end the session. Also. Right. So uh, at least now these are some of the thing. You, you don't know where to come or you cannot remember all the link. You just go to our website. Everything is over there. Okay. So you can get the information about this class and also the slides that Luis just presented will be there. And today the record, the video, uh, after this, if you miss or you, you, you didn't hear or you cannot remember or you want to recall back, any part are free to do so after the class. I mean, like once we put up the video, it'll be there in, so all you can, yeah, always come back and, and look at it, right. Then we will try to share uh, all the information. So it will be on our slide share. So you can, and it is also uh, on our website. So you can refer that after this. And um, if there is any more things that you would like to contact us, you can write to us. So with the email of us, uh, before I end the session, I would like to do a promotion for, for the next class. So um, we are going to stop for two weeks. So we, we have to stop for two weeks because uh, we are actually having a big event for Robocup at Home Education. So we have our online 11 and 28th of June. Uh, we are we're coming out with the with the announcements, the announcement, but you can head to our website and there is actually a page for uh, online challenge 2020. All of you uh, to, to, to join us. Okay, even, even you not join as a participant, uh, in the it, because it's an online session, so you can join like this. Okay, you can join because we invite you to come, and even uh, if possible, I would like to invite you as part of our jury. <laughs> Amy, oh, okay. right? So yeah, I, I hope I, I'll send you the invitation after this. Okay, okay. thank you. So uh, we will break for two weeks for this uh, invited lecture series. So next week we will stop, and the following week we will stop because in this between we have a Facebook page. You can get more information. It will be a very interesting event, and I hope all of you can join us. Uh, please uh, sign up so we have the registration like this Zoom session, online challenge session. Okay, then um, just before you leave, uh, maybe this will be interested. Uh, you'll be interested on, on this topic as well. So on the 8th of July, so I think, yeah, it's a bit quite far. It's like next month, <laughs> four weeks, three weeks, four, four weeks later. Okay, so um, we actually have the long-term collaborator. So previously I worked with Sebastian also. So currently Sebastian is now, uh, he's in um, MIT, uh, the CCL lab, which is a very famous lab, I think for all of you that work on robotics and AI. So this is a lab in the world. So um, we invite um, Sebastian to give um, all of you one very interesting topic. I think this is very interesting topic. Introduction to natural language. Sebastian actually picked up this thing, I think after he moved to, to, to MIT because like previously he's doing on MATLAB and other stuff. So it's very easy to learn how to pick up all these things. And uh, from a beginner point of view, he's going to like share with you his knowledge on how all these things get together. I'm, I'm not too sure like he, he can see that he, he will share with us with a very down to earth um, um, approach that even beginner level uh, people are very suitable to come and if you're interested. So um, the highlight is like uh, Sebastian will do a quick introduction on the state of natural language processing, which is very hot now, especially if you combine that with machine learning, deep learning is so what we use a lot over there. And I know him. So he will show you some demonstration uh, in, in Python. Okay, so I, 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 so if you want to know what is a natural language processing and how to actually uh, hands on on it, right? So I will welcome you to join our session. So um, currently, the if you head to our, okay, so you can sign up uh, right after this uh, for you to get the free access to, to this. I would like to introduce, uh, invite all of you to come to this session uh, to continue our activities and also, so I would like to close this session. So thanks, Louis, thanks for joining us and um, we hope to see you again. Okay. Okay. Right. So okay. for everyone, so thank you and have a nice day. See you.